Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Debbie. And what a joy to be here and uh, hear these stories of lives that have been touched. And if it's your first time here, very warm welcome to you. As we think about this theme of new beginnings with the babies and the baptisms, the new term, uh, and for us as a family, uh, this uh, week my oldest daughter goes off to university at the end of the week, which is quite a a massive kind of new beginning for us. Uh, Many of you know her. She's grown up in the life of the church. And I have to say, if you're watching this as a student uh, planning to come to Brighton, or if maybe you're here as a student, uh, uh, kind of just arriving, or I know there are other students who are just about to head off uh, as well for their first year at university, uh, I just want to say that for us as a church, Welcoming and loving students has always been such a big heartbeat. But as I think about my daughter going somewhere else, I know I long for churches to welcome her there. And I want to say, Holland Road, let's, let's see each new student that comes like it's one of our own students going. And let's love them deeply and help this be a place where they can grow in their faith and their walk with God. So, uh, you know, as we maybe start this new term and you think, well, it's great for these people having new beginnings, but I don't particularly feel like there's a new beginning in my life. I want to say that I really do think that, um, that God's got something fresh for us. You know, so often the greatest new beginnings, like what Craig described, are the new beginnings that happen in here, not just around us. I know that actually, in my life, there have been multiple times like that when I've had to come back and, as it were, start afresh and say, God, I want to put, as it were, yesterday behind me. I want to go forward with you in a fresh way. And so I want to talk about how does God bring new beginnings into any of our lives? That's what we're going to be thinking about this morning. You know, over this week, we've, uh, past week, we've had a kind of prayer and fasting week as a church. And one of the things that uh, we've been praying during that week is that God would grow our faith, our hope, and our love. And as those things grow in our life, it impacts our life and those around us. In fact, as I've been coming for this service, we've just uh, been reading about a time where there was like an open heaven. And one of my prayers is that there would be like an open heaven in this time this morning, that God would be speaking to us here in the building or if you're watching online, that we would see something fresh about Jesus. You know, if you ask that question, how does God bring about new beginnings in our lives, I believe it starts with us seeing something fresh about Jesus. And so as we look at these passages, uh, you know, these two stories in different parts of Matthew's gospel, I want us to uh, notice something about how Jesus encounters the people there. In the first, he he goes uh, from Galilee down to the kind of Jordan River Valley, and uh, that's where the place where John the Baptist is doing these baptisms, and uh, he kind of goes, as it were, down into the valley to to meet with people there. But in the other story, at the end of Matthew's gospel, he he calls uh, his disciples to come and join him up in in Galilee, and, uh, and they meet him on the top of a mountain. And I don't know whether you're on a mountain or in a valley, whether you're facing some crisis in your life or you've had a week and you just think this is wonderful. Whatever you're going through, I believe that Jesus wants to meet you and speak to you where you're at. You know, interestingly, in both of these readings, there's like a a new beginning happening. For Jesus, his baptism was like his beginning of ministry in a public way. And and, uh, for the, the kind of what's known in Matthew 28 as the Great Commission, that's like Jesus kind of passing on the baton and saying, right, now you go and do what I've been doing. It's like the beginning of their ministry. And in fact, in both times, it seems there are questions and doubts that people have. You know, uh, in uh, the second reading we had, it actually explicitly says that uh, some of them doubted. And we'll come on more to that. And in the first one, John has got a question. He, he sees Jesus come for baptism, and he thinks, well, what's going on here? Jesus, I should be baptized by you. Why are you coming here? 
And again, whether you're here this morning and you think, yeah, I get these songs, I get what Craig's saying, or you think, wow, really? Could that happen? Could that happen to me? I've got questions. I wonder, is this God thing real? Well, then Jesus wants to meet with you, whoever you are. You see, Jesus is surprising. John the Baptist had known Jesus for a long time. They were cousins, but he's plainly surprised by what Jesus is doing here. And I've, I've, uh, I've known about Jesus and walked with Jesus. I put my trust in him. In fact, when I was a student, I got baptized. And, uh, and yet, for these uh, kind of decades, as I've walked with Jesus, I find he is continually surprising me. Are you ready to be surprised afresh by Jesus? You know, when he comes... He, he, he comes to this place of baptism, which is this time when, uh, you know, people were going, we can read earlier in Matthew's gospel, they were going to the Jordan River to be baptized by John as a sign of repentance for the forgiveness of their sins, as a sign of their confession of their need of God's forgiveness. But, you know, one of the things that uh, was true about you know, everyone who went to be baptized uh, except Jesus was that God to forgive us in. When we have the questions later that we're going to ask those who get baptized here, the first question is this, do you admit you have sinned and you are in need of God's forgiveness? And I find as I meet with people and they've maybe uh, spent some time thinking about uh, God and they get to that place where they want to be baptized, that's the question that they go, Yes, absolutely. They know they've done things wrong. In fact, some of them, their journey has been trying to understand in a culture where we often minimize sin or kind of think maybe sin doesn't matter or maybe think, you know, it's just funny. To realize that actually sin is serious. Every story of abuse you read, every story of injustice you read, every story where there is greed and selfishness and bitterness, that is all sin, and it is not just out there or in the newspapers. All of us know those things affect our hearts. That we live in a broken world where the brokenness is not just out there, but it is in here. And so all of us here in this building have sinned and are in need of God's forgiveness. That's why people flock to be baptized by John. But Jesus was different. John knew that there was nothing in Jesus' life that he had done wrong. He wasn't like anyone else that John knew. And so John says, look, this doesn't feel right. And yet Jesus says, no, this is right. Let's do this now. He, he says these words in, in Matthew 3. He says, Jesus replied to him, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And John said, kind of, okay. And why was it right for Jesus to do this? Well, because Jesus had come from heaven, the prince of heaven, the only person who lived a perfect life, but he'd come to identify with you and I. He'd come into our place of pain and brokenness and suffering and even to take our sin. And so he got down in the water. He went down and down to identify with you and I, to humble himself to the lowest place. There is no mess in your life that Jesus is not willing to stoop down to help lift you up. There is no problem in those you love or in the situations around you where Jesus is not willing to go down and down and down to be identified with us, to help us. In fact, when people are baptized, it's a picture of like dying to an old life and being raised to new. And that is what Jesus did. He didn't just come to be baptized. He came to die on a cross for my sin and yours. He came to deal with that problem that we all have, the biggest problem in our world. He came and he died for it, and then he rose again, defeating it, and saying, it is done, it is complete. David's sin is forgiven. Your sin can be forgiven as you put your trust in Jesus. Hallelujah. 
That is why these moments are such celebrations, because we've discovered a Savior, one who was willing to come from heaven and identify with us. And as he comes up out of the water, heaven kind of opens, and the, the Father speaks from heaven, this is my Son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. And, and a dove, a, a kind of symbol of the Spirit, rests. the Spirit rests upon Jesus. And it reminds me of the story of Noah's Ark, where a dove kind of settles after the floodwaters are receding, kind of signifying this is a new era, a new creation, a new time, and the dove settles on Jesus because in Jesus' death and resurrection, we discover humanity has a new creation, a new opportunity to have life in him. And Father, Son, and Spirit are wonderfully working together here. It's like uh, just as they made mankind in the beginning of the Bible, here we see that they together say, let's save mankind. This is good. This Jesus coming to save the world. They're together in it. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If anyone ever asked you, where is the Trinity in the Bible? Turn to Matthew chapter 3. And so allow Jesus to surprise you afresh. He takes the lowest place, but then wonderfully in, in, uh, in the end of Matthew, in Matthew 28, what we see is Jesus, is, is, he comes to these people who are, uh, you know, it's after his death and resurrection, and it says in Matthew 28, verse uh, 16 and 17, it says, when they saw him, they worshipped him, though some doubted. And I can imagine both. You know, if, you've, if you know someone, you saw him die, and then you see him alive, you'd think, wow, wow, there's awe, there's worship. Of course there was. But you're also going to have questions. You're going to think, really? How? Who are you? I thought I knew you, but this is on another level. And I tell you, Jesus is one who there is always more to discover. I love that this church encourages people to ask questions. To express where you've got doubts. In fact, on your seats, there's something called the invitation for an alpha course. It's often symbolized with just a question mark. It's a place you can come and ask your questions. In fact, as part of Craig's journey and Emily's journey, they've both done this course. I highly commend it to you. It starts at the end of October. If you're watching online, you're not even in this city, find a place nearby. It's a great thing. I would love you to join me as we do this course together. But, you know, back in Matthew 28, as Jesus comes to these people who are worshiping or doubting, he comes and he says this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That is Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. You know, this is one of those things that Jesus says, which, to be honest, after all these years, I'm still trying to get my head around. How amazing a statement this is. Even this week, I've been thinking again, and I found my, my view of Jesus, this one who didn't just willing to take the lowest place to stoop and go so low, but the one who's been raised up to have the highest place, like so high you cannot imagine, the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. Can you get your head around that? This week, may you know the authority and power of Jesus. As you read through the Gospels, you see his authority to forgive sins, his authority to heal, his authority to make us his children, to adopt us in his family, his authority to drive out evil, to save, to transform and renew and restore, his authority to judge and his authority to teach. Jesus is the one who can tell us what's right and wrong. Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. Do you need a fresh vision of Jesus this morning? That for you and those around you, he can help you. That he is willing so humbly to be identified with you, but so wonderfully to be raised up. You know, I think when we recognize Jesus' authority, we then start getting on board with his purpose for us. And that's where I want to lastly just end. And that's a fresh purpose for our lives. You see, because Jesus then goes on and he says, therefore, in the beginning of verse 19, he says, because of this authority, therefore, and, and, he, and he kind of, he says this thing which we sometimes refer to as the Great Commission, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. And I want you to know that the Great Commission is not a great suggestion. Jesus says, therefore, go. It's a command. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that those who believe in his authority are called to do, to go and make disciples. Whether you're going into a new term, a new week, a new job, 
to go with a renewed vision of who he is and what he can do, to go and make disciples. What's a disciple? Well, a disciple literally means learner. It's one who's learning from Jesus, following his example and lead. One commentator says this, a disciple is not one who has already learned, but one who is always learning. The school days of a Christian are never over. So you might have thought, oh, the kids are back to school. So glad I'm not at school anymore. The school days of Christian are never over, but we have the best teacher ever. The teacher who's willing to die for us, to help us, to come alongside us. And he calls us as we're learning to help others learn. As you are learning, you are to make disciples of others to help them learn. This simple couple of words, this great commission has such a massive kind of perspective, both locally and globally. But I love this phrase that Dawson Trotman says. He says, vision for the world starts with having vision for one person. So who could you share what you've learned about Jesus with? That's our heart as a church, that uh, we would be those who are helping raise up others, that every generation would be raising the next generation to be free, to be following Jesus, to be reaching out, to be an extended family and do everything in love. This is our vision. This is uh, based on Matthew 28. This is our longing uh, to, to see those values of following Jesus, reaching out, being an extended family and doing everything in love, growing in each and every generation. Will you, as you see Jesus afresh, would you allow him to say, yes, you, and you, and you, and you, and you. I want you to be part of what I'm doing, of bringing hope to others, of bringing love to others, of helping them know the good news for themselves. I loved, Craig, the way you talked about your longing to go back and help and help others who are from difficult situations to discover that love. So how do we do that? Well, lastly, there are two things that Jesus mentions. He mentions, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the Trinity again. And and baptism is what we're about to see right uh, now at the end of our service. Baptism is this picture of people being identified with Jesus through his death and resurrection, saying, I believe in that. And so they kind of are buried with Christ and raised to a new life in Christ. You know, like Jesus was willing to identify with us, at baptism, he invites us to be identified with him. To say, yeah, come and say publicly, like Craig was saying, I want people to know I'm a follower of Jesus. I I love this book. It's by Paul Miller, and it's called The J-Curve. And the little strap line, I don't know if you can read it, says, dying and rising with Jesus in everyday life. Because if you've been baptized already, if you're a disciple of Jesus, then your baptism is a model of how to live your life each day. To each day say, Jesus, I want to die to doing things my way, and I want to have a new, new kind of day of living your way. Whatever's past, thank you for your forgiveness, and I'm now going to live afresh for you today. Help me through the power of your death and resurrection to live for you. And so baptism is this wonderful starting place. It's a place of saying, I, I've been born again in Christ. You know, Jesus himself said, you must be born again. And baptism is this picture of new birth. Do you need new birth, cleansing on the inside? Do you need a new beginning today? Do you need Jesus to come and deal with your past and give you hope for the future? He can do that. And as we make disciples, we baptize them and we teach them to obey everything, everything. It's not a pick and mix type of following. Everything that Jesus has told them. And so that is why I want to call you as we end, to go forward from this place with not just a fresh vision of Jesus, but a fresh purpose in your life. A fresh ability to say, I'm going to go forward with confidence because I believe the promise at the end of this that Jesus is with me. And that changes everything. It gives us uh, a reason to not be afraid. You know, the most common reason the Bible gives to not be afraid. It says, don't be afraid, not because you're good enough or you're sorted enough, but because God is with you. 
Jesus is with you. He's with you, Craig. He's with you, Emily. He's with you and I as we decide that we want to follow his great commission in our lives. And so I call you today afresh. Look up to him. Believe in him. Maybe even right now you just need to come and do some business with God in the quietness of this place. I'm going to invite the band to come up. And just as we prepare for these baptisms, I want to invite you, maybe for the first time even, to put your trust in Jesus. I find that as I come to Jesus and see afresh who he is, I often need to say sorry. And I'm just going to pray a simple prayer that says, sorry, Jesus, for when I've ignored you, when I've gone my own way. And then I'm going to pray, thank you, Jesus. I put my trust in you, in your death for me. I believe in you. I want you to come into my life. Please help me live for you by the power of your spirit. And so if you want to pray that simple, sorry, thank you, please pray with me, then let's bow our heads together. And in this moment, why not echo this prayer in your heart? Jesus, I'm sorry for where I've ignored you and lived my life my own way. Sorry for my sin. Thank you, Jesus, that you died for me. I believe in you. Please help me follow you. Please fill me with your spirit. Please go with me into the rest of my life. And with every head bowed, if you've been echoing that prayer in your heart, would you just lift your hand as a sign of saying, yeah, I'm believing in Jesus today, seeing some hands go up around the place. Lord, you see each hand, you see each heart. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that these folks would know that you are with them and that you would help us have fresh beginnings in our life. And just still with every head bowed, you're going to see in a moment Emily and Craig getting baptized. And if you'd like to know more about baptism, I've got a, a book at the door I'd love to give you, but I'm also uh, doing a class next week. And if you'd be interested in, in baptism, will you just also with every head bowed, just give me a wave and maybe I'll try and get that information about the baptism to you. Thank you. I'm just seeing some folks just putting their hand up. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, as we come now into the rest of the service, help us to follow you. Those of us who've already been baptized already know you. Lord, help us to be willing to die to ourselves each day to live for you. In the power of your spirit, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. The band are going to lead.